All right, well, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to Mercer University's Professional Development Series. My name is Myron Rando. I'm the Associate Director of Recruitment and Community Engagement, and it is my pleasure to welcome you once again to another installment of this Professional Development Series. Today, we have got uh, a question on the table uh, that we're looking forward to learning a little bit more about and hearing some answers to. Today, we're talking about privacy. So we live in a digital world where there's lots of personal data flowing from hands to other hands. Uh, and so we wanna know what is our privacy like online and what is our privacy like in this digital world? To have that conversation with us, uh, we have got one of our distinguished university professors from the Stetson Hatcher School of Business, a dear friend of mine, a distinguished professor of computer science and law, Dr. Jody Blank. Jody, how are you doing on this wonderful Wednesday? Doing great, thanks. Uh, so before we begin, how long have you been at Mercer? I know it's quite some time. A long time. This is finishing up my 35th year at Mercer University. 35 years, so a lot of time in the paint uh, and an expert at privacy law and data. And so we're excited to learn a little bit more from you uh, about this particular topic. To the folks that are watching us, we want your questions. And I know uh, Professor Blank is anxious to answer those. So. At the bottom of your screen, there's a question and answer function. Put your questions in that question and answer function at any time throughout the presentation. And then when Dr. Blank is finished, we will pull up that question and answer feature and we will answer your questions. Uh, but until then, I'm gonna give the floor over to Professor Jody Blank and we'll see you at the end. The floor is yours, okay. my friend. Thank you, thank you. First thing, let me explain the computer science and law. People always ask about that. And I had gone to graduate school and gotten a master's degree in computer science and then went directly to law school. I practiced law for a few years. I'm a member of the bars in New York and in Georgia. And after practicing law for a couple of years, clerking for a judge, I got into teaching full time. And when I started teaching, I was teaching primarily computer science. And in fact, when I came to Mercer back in 1985, it was to chair the computer science department at the then College of Arts and Sciences in Atlanta. And I did that for about five years. And then the computer science department was moved to the business school. And so I have been in the business school for the last 30 years. We kept the bachelor's degree in computer science program for about six or eight years. And then when Mercer was going for AACSB business school accreditation, the decision was made to terminate the BS in computer science. So for the first 10 or 12 years of my career, I taught primarily computer science courses with a little bit of law here and there. And since that time, I have taught primarily law and ethics courses at the business school. And I've always been interested in technology. And so I have taught a variety of courses in web design and computers and the law and technology and the law and now, uh, privacy law and policy, and in our data analytics program, the legal and ethical issues affecting big data. And so my interest has definitely been in privacy law um, pretty much the whole time I've been teaching, and particularly the last 20 years or so, as we will talk about how privacy law has developed in this country and also in the world. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what privacy law is in the United States. And the law we have is known as a very sectoral approach. In other words, there's a great deal of privacy protection for certain types of information. For example, the granddaddy of all privacy-related acts in the U.S. is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. This applies to Equifax and Experian and Transamerica. This has to do with your credit information. So since 1970, this has been greatly protecting your information. There were a lot of rules and regulations for your credit information. In 1974, FERPA, which many of you probably heard of, it applies to your educational information. Again, there are lots of good privacy rules and protections for your educational information. A third and important one is HIPAA. 
which again, you've probably all heard of whenever you go to a doctor's office, they make sure they give you information saying, and it's more the information saying that you acknowledge they told you about HIPAA, probably rather than explaining what your rights are, which is what the intention is, but at least there is good privacy protection for your medical information. And this one didn't kick in until 1996. An interesting story about this sectoral approach. And so what we see up here, there's one more we're gonna talk about, but pretty much in the US, your information pertaining to your credit report, your educational information and your health information are well protected. Your other information, not so much, except for 1988, Congress passed the Video Privacy Protection Act. And there's an interesting story behind this. I don't know if any of you remember Robert Bork or if you ever heard of him. Some of you, most of you probably not alive at that point. But Robert uh, Bork was a controversial appointee of President Reagan in 1987 for a Supreme Court opening. He was very conservative and there was a lot written about his uh, nomination. And a reporter in Washington, D.C., where he lived, thought, you know, I'm going to go over to the local videotape store and see if I can get a printout of what kind of movies he rented. Now, he was probably looking for some juicy information about him. And understand that this is before the blockbuster era. And so you had local mom and pop video stores. Where I lived at the time, uh, Video Joe was our local video store. And so I'll use that name. The reporter in Washington walked into the local Video Joe store and said, you know, could I get a printout of the video rentals of Robert Bork, who I know rents movies here? And for whatever reason, the clerk at the store said, yeah, sure, and printed it out. Now, the reporter was probably disappointed that all he learned was that Bork was a big fan of John Wayne and Western movies and uh, crime dramas. and did not rent the kind of movies that the reporter was probably hoping for. However, many congressmen, and I'll use the term congressmen there, not generically, it was probably mostly men, said, wait a minute, you mean they keep records of the movies we rent? And very quickly, in a very short period of time, Congress passed the Video Privacy Protection Act. It passed in 1988, and it protects your video rental habits. And so this is one of those sectors of protection you have. Now, remember HIPAA did not pass until 1996. I remember teaching classes in that time period from 1988 to 1996, where I will tell, would tell students and try to convince them that, no, it's, it's true. You have more privacy protection in your video rental habits than you do in your medical information. So in the US, the approach is very limited to specific pieces of legislation. Is there a constitutional right to privacy in the United States? Well, if you look at the Constitution and you do a word search on the Constitution, you will not find the word privacy. That doesn't mean, however, that there's not a right to privacy. And in fact, in 1965, the Supreme Court, in a case called Griswold versus Connecticut, found that yes, in fact, there is a right to privacy. The Constitution doesn't specifically provide for it, but it's found in the penumbras or the shadows of the Bill of Rights. For example, the First Amendment freedom of association, the Fourth Amendment freedom from unreasonable search and seizure, the Fifth Amendment freedom from self-incrimination, they don't speak specifically about privacy, but the gist of those, in the shadows of those, the penumbras of those, the US Supreme Court said, yes, there is a federally protected right to privacy. A couple of years later, there was a very important case in the Supreme Court with regard to privacy. It introduced a standard known as the reasonable expectation of privacy, which pretty much has been in effect for the last 50 years or so. And it's an interesting case. And first, let me explain these pictures. 
There's that good looking gentleman in the phone booth, red phone booth. We'll get back to phone booths in a second. This is actually at the Canadian Pavilion at Epcot at Walt Disney World, for those of you who may have been there. And this was from the Cafe Intermezzo at Perimeter. And this is a former student of mine, Sylvia Leva. And this probably goes back eight or 10 years now. And the reason why I'm going through this discussion is we will see in this cat's case, a telephone booth is very important in the creation of that reasonable expectation of privacy standard. But there are probably some of you watching this who are thinking to yourselves, what is that? I've never seen a phone booth. Phone booths are disappearing. I challenged my students 10 or 12 years ago, if you can find a functional phone booth here in Atlanta, Take a picture of yourself in the phone booth and I will put it in my PowerPoint presentation when I talk about privacy and tort law. And Sylvia was the only student who ever found a functioning phone booth. I do not think it's still there at Cafe Intermezzo. I've heard rumors that there's another one now down near Georgia State that there is some new bar or restaurant that opened up that may have one. Anyway, a phone booth is disappearing part of Americana, you used to be able to walk into a phone booth, close the door behind you, put a dime or a quarter into the payphone, and make your phone conversation, okay? This is relevant in the Katz case. Charlie Katz was a bookie in Los Angeles, and the FBI knew what he was doing and was trying to set up a sting operation to catch him on the phone making or placing a bet. Now understand that this is 1967, so the technology is very different. Outside of the apartment where Charlie Katz lived, there were three phone booths next to each other. And the technology that the FBI had to use was an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that they had to put on the top of the phone booth that would catch his conversation when he went inside the phone booth. They realized, however, that it would only work if the phone, if the tape recorder was between two of the phone booths. So they had to arrange with the phone company beforehand to make sure that one of the end phone booths was not working so that he would have to place a call in one of the other two. And the FBI put the tape recorder on top in between those two phone booths. They had an agent upstairs on the floor in which he lived. And when Charlie Katz left his apartment to go downstairs, presumably to use the phone booth, the FBI agent on his floor used a walkie talkie to contact one of the FBI agents on the ground who had to quickly run over to the phone booths and reach up and press play and record to start the tape recorder to work and quickly ran back. And sure enough, Charlie came down, went into one of the phone booths, walked in, hold the door shut, and made a phone call to take or place a bet. The FBI had it on tape. They charged him with illegal bookmaking. He was convicted, and he appealed his case on the grounds that since the FBI did not have a search warrant, what they did was a violation of his privacy, of his Fourth, or fifth, or fourth Amendment rights to illegal search and seizure. And the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in 1967, the Supreme Court, and in this first opinion, it was a concurring opinion, which means that the judge agreed with the outcome, but had his own two cents worth, so to speak. And it was first introduced in a, a concurring opinion in the United States versus, 19, uh, versus Katz in 1967, this notion of a reasonable expectation of privacy. The court basically said, when someone walks into a phone booth, albeit a public phone booth in a public place and closes the door behind them, they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And so his conviction was thrown out. And this standard now is 53 years old, the reasonable expectation of privacy. All right, you've probably heard of the adage, your home is your castle. And with regard to privacy in the US, it largely is true. Your greatest expectation of privacy is in your home. In another Supreme Court case in 2001, 
police in Oregon were using a thermal imaging device to ride up and down the street in their car and point the devices at the homes along the street. The device was able to detect large emissions of light coming from a house that were not visible to the naked eye because people would tape shut windows and doors if they were growing marijuana in their home. And that's what police were looking for. So sure enough, as they were driving by someone's home, the device started beeping and they went to the house and went in and discovered marijuana. And they arrested him with illegal growing possession of marijuana. And again, without a valid search warrant, if they had waited and gotten a search warrant, we never would have heard of this case, but they didn't get a search warrant. And so the allegation was, this was a violation of his privacy. Police just can't come to someone's home, knock on the door and say, we found evidence that you're growing marijuana. And the Supreme Court in 2001 basically said that your privacy in your home is at its utmost. And this was a violation of his privacy two interesting cases that go along with this discussion. The first one you'll notice is from 1986. So this goes back a few years. It's a Georgia case. Michael Bowers was the attorney general of Georgia at the time. And in this case, police were executing a valid search warrant on a house. And when they went into the house, they discovered two men engaged in an act that they knew was illegal in Georgia. And so they charged the two men with sodomy. They were convicted. And again, the men challenged the conviction on the basis of their privacy had been violated, their right to privacy. What they do in their own home is their business. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in a very close decision, a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court said the police were legally where they had a right to be with a search warrant. They observed behavior that they knew was illegal and had no option but to arrest the men for sodomy. Okay, what's interesting about this is that 17 years later, and in the lifetime of the Supreme Court, 17 years is a pretty short time. In 2003, in a case that came out of Texas that had almost the same facts, the Supreme Court specifically overruled itself in the Bowers case and in Lawrence versus Texas, basically said, this is a violation of privacy. What consenting adults do in the privacy of their home is their own business, is not the business of the state. And they basically struck down a variety of sodomy laws that existed in several different states at that time. So, an important lesson to be learned from these two cases is that the only reason that the outcome was different was that society had changed. Social values, social norms had changed enough from 1986 to 2003 that what the court said was okay in a close 5-4 decision, 17 years later, it flipped the other way, and in a 6-3 decision, the Supreme Court said, no, this invades one's right to privacy. All right, what about your workplace? How much privacy do you have in your workplace? Not so much. If a supervisor comes into your office and says, I'd like to look in your desk drawer, or I'd like to look in your hard drive, or I'd like to look in a bookcase, closet, whatever it is you have, do you have an expectation of privacy there? Probably not. This is something that has also changed over the last 20 years or so. 20 years ago, you probably had more of an expectation to say, well, this is my drawer. I mean, I put stuff, stuff in there and I have some expectation of privacy. Employers have let employees know in no uncertain terms that pretty much everything in your office is theirs. And so your expectation of privacy is very low at work. Is it zero? Not quite zero. Students say zero, I'll say, well, approaching zero, but not zero. Where do you have an expectation of privacy in the workplace? That's right, the restroom. But that's about it. Does your restroom look like that? 
All right, what about privacy on the web? Don't I have some privacy on the web? Well, unfortunately, unless you're under 13 years old, you probably don't have much. In 1998, which was fairly early on in the era of the web, Congress passed the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which very well protects privacy of children online, but it doesn't protect adults. Shortly after 1998, something happened that changed the whole climate regarding privacy. There were a number of privacy bills in Congress that could have extended the same kind of rigorous privacy protection that kids have online to everyone. Any ideas what happened shortly after 1998 to change this whole environment? 9-11. After 9-11, whenever a court balances, and courts often use a balancing, you see a scale of justice. After 9-11, security almost always outweighed individual privacy. And so there has not been a whole lot of legislation from Congress regarding privacy since then. He said, well, wait a minute, on the web, I know that I see privacy policies all the time. They protect my privacy, right? Unfortunately, no. If any of you have ever read the privacy policies, you probably know that. In my courses, that's one of the lessons we do is analyze a privacy policy of a company. Take a look at one of them. The reason for this is the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission is a federal agency and they protect against fraudulent and deceitful behavior of companies. So if a company makes promises and then violates the promises, the FTC can bring action against them. So early on in the era of the web, many companies, in order to convince consumers to trust them, would make statements like, we will never share your information. And as most of you probably know, very few businesses don't share your information. And in the early days of the web, there were companies that were making statements like this, we will never share your information. And guess what happened to them when it was discovered they were sharing your information? The FTC came against them, okay, and pursued action against them. So what did companies quickly learn? Well, make up a privacy statement that is not fraudulent and deceitful. Tell people what you're doing. Our policy is to collect every single piece of information about you we can get your hands on and sell it to anyone willing to pay cash for it, which is more or less what the privacy policies of most companies are, okay? What about the FTC? Well, they have no ability to pursue this because the companies are doing exactly what they say they are going to do. And unfortunately, this is pretty much the standard on the web. Most companies in their very long and voluminous privacy policies more or less say, we're gonna collect everything we can and we'll share it with whomever we want to. Well, what will it take to change? Here's a pretty good diagram illustrating your privacy on the web. Is there any room for optimism? Is this gonna change at all? Well, I wrote an article last year, top 10 reasons to be optimistic about privacy that at least includes some glimmers of hope. If you're interested in this article, you can go to my website, there's a link to it, or if you search the title of the article, the author, it's an Idaho Law Review, you can find this article. We are going to talk about the top four reasons to be somewhat optimistic about privacy. Number four, social norms continue to evolve. This is very important. It affects all of the other reasons as well. What does this mean? This is again a picture of somebody that most of you probably will not recognize. Uh, for any of you who were alive and aware in 1987, this was actually the second person 
that President Reagan nominated for a Supreme Court seat after the nomination of Robert Bork, who we talked about before with videotapes. Uh, his nomination failed. He withdrew the, withdrew the nomination. And Douglas Ginsburg was nominated to be a Supreme Court justice. Well, what happened to his nomination? Well, in 1987, as this Newsweek issue indicates, his nomination went up in smoke. He admitted that he had smoked marijuana in college, and I think also in his early days as a faculty member at Harvard Law School. And so he had to withdraw his nomination because at that point in time, it was just not socially acceptable. Some of you may also remember or may have heard about the fact that Bill Clinton had a battle similar to this where he admitted that he had smoked marijuana, but said that he did not inhale. And this is a photograph that I personally took at the Turf Tavern in Oxford, England, where, and I don't know if you can read this, but it says, it is alleged that it was here at the Turf Tavern that Bill Clinton, while here at Oxford University during the 60s, quote, did not inhale, end quote, while smoking illegal substances. And Clinton did survive this, but basically because he was able to say, well, I didn't inhale. What has happened to the social stigma or the social values, social norms regarding marijuana? Well, in more recent days, Clarence Thomas admitted during his Supreme Court nomination process that he had smoked pot in college as did George Bush and Barack Obama. What happened to their political careers, their public careers? Uh, pretty much nothing. How come? What was the difference? Well, from the 1980s until the 1990s and into today, there have been changing social norms, social values with regard to marijuana and its usage. All right, another example of this. Does anyone know who is pictured here? Mildred and Richard Loving. And there was a movie about them about four years ago. And in 1967, and I don't know how many people in the room here were alive then. I may be the only one. But in 1967, 16 states prohibited people of different races from marrying. The Lovings lived in Virginia and they wanted to get married. But Virginia had a statute called the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, which was still valid and effective in Virginia and 15 other states. And so their case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And it wasn't until this 1967 case that the Supreme Court struck down those laws prohibiting people of different races from marrying. This was 1967. And again, most of you probably were not alive, but I was alive and maybe a couple of other people out there. Now, five years ago, all of you were alive. What happened five years ago? Well, prior to five years ago, if you go back 20 years, it was not legal anywhere in the United States for people of the same sex to marry. And over the last 20 years or so, we started to see that change state by state. And five years ago, the Supreme Court declared basically that the right to marry was a fundamental right protected by the Constitution and could not be denied to people who are of the same sex. And so obviously the explanation for this is social values change. Over time, norms change, values change, and what might have been acceptable at some point in time is no longer acceptable. And so this is certainly happening with privacy to some extent as we watch social values evolve. All right, back to my list of top four reasons we'll look at to be optimistic. The recognition of trust as an important privacy factor. More and more we are seeing that people and companies are understanding that unless someone trusts a company, 
they're probably not going to want to do business with them. I will discuss this in conjunction with number two, which privacy is business strategy. Related to this notion of trust, more and more companies are recognizing that an important factor for their consumers and customers is trusting the company. And so more and more companies are starting to sell privacy, so to speak, to say we are going to recognize your privacy. Two quick examples. One of them you may or may not have heard of. They're doing a pretty good job of getting the word out now. Um, you may have noticed it earlier on when I said that you could search, from some, search for something on the web. I did not say you can Google it. I actually have finally divorced myself from Google search engine for the last six months or so. I have been using DuckDuckGo. It is a search engine and they do not collect any information nor sell any information about you. And for people who are concerned about privacy, that's important. Um, I had tried switching to DuckDuckGo a few times over the last few years, and each time I just felt that the results weren't as rich as a Google search. And finally, when I switched earlier this year, in January, I think it was, both at home and at work, um, the results are fine. They're just as good as Google. And so one example of businesses realizing that trust is important is DuckDuckGo. Another one that has been an important player in the last several years in promoting the notion of trust and privacy is Apple. Many of you have Apple iPhones. Some of you may be aware of the fact that privacy has become a very important factor and strategy at Apple. It has gotten to the point where I do not access my bank account other than on my iPhone. I do not do it from my laptop. I don't have an Apple Mac, so I, I, you know, I don't have Apple there, but I do not access my bank account other than from my iPhone because I trust in what Apple is doing with regard to the privacy protections they're taking, which includes keeping information on your phone in many cases rather than sending it back. All of that photo recognition when you, facial recognition when you uh, log into your phone, the fingerprints, that information is kept on your phone. It is not sent back to Apple. And so that is a very pro-privacy pro stance. Um, Apple has definitely headed in the direction of privacy as strategy. All right, the number one reason to be optimistic about the future of privacy is peer pressure. Any idea what this is about? Be two parts to this. The first, is peer pressure from Europe. Many of you may have been aware of, because there was a lot of stuff on the web, about the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which became effective in May of 2018. And companies that dealt with international clients and customers had to change their privacy policies, particularly for residents of the EU. Unlike the US, the European Union countries have what is known as omnibus or comprehensive protection for personal information. Remember we said in the US we have a very sectoral approach. Unless you're talking about your health records, your fair credit reporting information, or your video rental habits, you pretty much have zero to maybe a little privacy protection, not much. In Europe, the approach is completely different. What Europe refers to as data protection, which is a part of privacy. Data protection in the EU is viewed as a fundamental human right. And so data protection in Europe is very different. This GDPR was not the first uh, comprehensive regulation. There was one dating back to 1995 that preceded the GDPR. The GDPR became just more rigorous than its predecessor. But data protection in the EU has been important since the 1990s, at least, going back that far. The other peer pressure comes from California. The California Consumer Privacy Act became effective this January. It was passed a couple of years ago, and it obviously protects Californians. Now, the reason why this peer pressure is so important on privacy and the future of privacy is 
that while the GDPR applies and gives rights only to European citizens, and the CCPA gives rights and protection only to Californians, we did see some trickle down advantages from the GDPR. For those of you for whom the GDPR rung a bell that said, yeah, I remember that a couple of years ago, we all got some protection from that because some companies just decided it's not worth having different policies for Europeans and Americans and whatever other countries, we're just going to change our policies. The same thing is happening with the CCPA. Companies had to change their privacy policies and their websites to put certain notices up for Californians. And some companies just said, all right, and we're just gonna make these changes across the board. You probably don't get all of the rights, but you get at least some of those benefits. Now, I mentioned before that Apple has become one of the pro-privacy companies. One that is following in the direction of Apple is Microsoft. Microsoft had a statement after the passage of the CCPA that basically said, we were the first company to voluntarily extend these core data privacy rights in the GDPR to customers around the world, not just citizens of the EU. And Microsoft also said, we are going to extend CCPA's core rights for people to control their data to all of our customers in the US. So even though you don't live in California, Microsoft is going to provide the rights to be able to opt out of information, to be able to correct information, to be able to do the things that Californians can now do that no one else in the US can, that Europeans can do to anyone. But Microsoft made this decision. Other companies, have not followed, do not have to follow. And in fact, in the broad scheme of things, in my privacy courses, when I have students examine the privacy policies of some of the large companies, I typically assign Facebook and Google and Apple and often Amazon. As I mentioned, Apple has decidedly headed in one direction, pro-privacy, and Microsoft looks like it's following in that direction. Facebook and Google and Amazon as well, are still way, way out in the other direction. They are beginning to provide a little bit of options, but when you read the privacy policies, you really don't get a whole lot of protection. So, what happens next? Well, one of the important things, as I mentioned, is we're watching social values evolve. How does this happen? Probably most of you remember a few years ago, Facebook got into a whole lot of trouble. Facebook gets into trouble all the time. Uh, the Cambridge Analytica uh, debacle. And people lost a lot of trust in Facebook. Many people left. As more and more things come out about Facebook and Google, people are leaving and they're not trusting them. You know, they're saying, well, we'll, we'll do it. I'll search somewhere else other than Google. You know, I won't be involved in Facebook. And so we are watching these values change. Often, we get legislation when there is a public outcry or outrage <clears throat> with certain policies, with laws, and laws change. We are watching companies decide that it is worth it to us to sell privacy. We're going to change our policies because people want this. People want to trust us. We want to be trusted. And so some companies like Apple and Microsoft are making these changes. We will also see more states pass privacy laws. Going back to California passing that law, as many of you may know, some of you may not, the vast amount of law that affects us on a daily basis is state law. We live in a system of dual laws. There's federal law and there's state law. We are subject to the laws of the federal government anywhere in the country. We are subject to the laws of the state in which we reside. Or if we go to another state, some of you may notice when you head to Florida or South Carolina on a motorcycle, if you're in Georgia, you need to wear a helmet. Once you get out of Georgia and head into South Carolina, Florida, you don't need to wear a helmet. How come? State laws vary. And so it is definitely the case that state laws vary. State laws are different. They can be different. And arguably, they should be different. Why should they be different? Well, that's where we get new laws. California just passed this new privacy law. Will it be the only state to do that? Probably not. And in fact, last year in 2019, 
the year after California passed the law. Remember, California passed the law in 2018. It did not become effective until this year. So a handful or two of other states last year proposed privacy bills, most of them modeled after the CCPA. None of them passed. Two states passed very limited provisions, Nevada and Maine, not nearly as broad as California. It's good that they pass something, but it doesn't provide the kind of protection that the California law passes. Will we see other states pass privacy laws in the next couple of years? Yes, I think we will. All right, let's see. Um, okay, well, oh, okay, last slide, and then we'll turn it over to questions. What about COVID-19 and privacy? One of the areas in which there was discussion about how good and how helpful big data can be is in regard to public health. But we have seen a total fail with data and public health because there's no data, there's no testing. We can't isolate something if we don't have data and the testing has just been not sufficient enough. You may have read about other countries that have experimented with different technologies to perform this contact tracing. And in some of these countries, it has been very successful. Singapore and South Korea have very rigorous contact tracing, but it has worked to uh, certainly flatten the curve and more. You may have read also about Apple and Google developing an API that will use Bluetooth and enable the development of apps to try to do contact tracing. And in fact, just this week, earlier this week, Ireland is the first country that I know of that used this Apple Google API to roll out an app to try to do contract, contact tracing within Ireland. So rather than go on, I will open this up now for questions and comments. Here is contact information for me, my email address. Uh, that is my website address that has links to these articles. And for those of you who are particularly interested in this topic, another article, um, if you're interested, privacy and outrage touches upon what I mentioned a few minutes ago, that often change comes when the public is outraged. And if there are questions on this, I'll get into this further. But otherwise, let me stop for now and see if there are any questions. First off, that was fascinating. A little scary as well, you know, it's but scary. definitely fascinating. So we do have some questions. So uh, one person is interested on Zoom. So a lot of our meetings now have migrated to Zoom. What about the privacy features of Zoom? We heard earlier in the life of Zoom that folks were breaking into Zoom calls and, and saying wild things on them. Do we have any privacy as it relates to Zoom? Okay, and you touched upon something that I, I was going to mention I didn't. Understand when we talk about all of this, there's security and there's privacy. When you read about data breaches, that's more a security issue. Obviously, it affects privacy. Mm -hmm. And in the development of privacy and security, typically we've had people who've worked in the privacy realm and people who work in the security realm. And unfortunately, over the years, there hasn't been a whole lot of dovetailing of those efforts. If you're a privacy person, you think of security as a subset of privacy. If you're a security person, you think of privacy as a subset of security. Uh, security. Fortunately, we are now seeing more recognition that they go hand in hand, they are intertwined, they are interrelated, and the more security you have, the more privacy, the more privacy you have, the more security, and so we are headed in that direction. So let me first you know, the, describe about security versus privacy. Okay, and what was the specific? I know I heard oh, that part oh, got off. The specific question oh, was Zoom, about Zoom, Zoom okay. as a product. Yeah. yeah. Some of you may remember when Zoom first becoming, became this enormous thing in March when everyone was going to it, there was a lot of pushback on its privacy policies. And it spent a lot of time working not only on the security aspect, which was the Zoom bombers, but also on the privacy aspect. And this is something that a lot of online tools need to work on. Unfortunately, a lot of environments like Zoom and Canvas and BlueJeans and others, if you read the privacy policies, it's not good. 
you know, you're basically giving permission to them to do whatever you want with it. Um, you know, Facebook and many, this has become in the news many times now, when you're on Facebook, you basically are giving them permission to do whatever they want to with your photographs and posts. <laughs> and so that's something that we're starting to see a little bit of change in, but that's the environment that we have been in. Um, in a broad scheme, we talked about the fact that the FTC is responsible for making sure there's no fraud and deceit. Absent that, the, the term that describes what privacy has been in the U.S. on the web and in the commercial environment is self-regulation. And that's scary. What that means is companies self-regulate. So they decide if, well, if we want to do this, we'll do that. We're regulating ourselves. And that's where the California legislation, the EU, are pushing back against that general approach that in the U.S. it's pretty much been self-regulation. Unless you're covered in one of those sectors, health, video rentals, or unless you're in California now, reasonable expectation and self-regulation is the norm. You know, that's where we are beginning to see some movement from that. That makes me kind of nervous because you can't expect a fox to guard a hen house. Uh, and that's essentially what we're asking when we ask companies to self-regulate as a relationship. Absolutely. To you know, all those things you hear about Facebook and Google, who ultimately is regulating Facebook and Google. Google Facebook and Google. Google. Wow. You know, and you may have heard that there have been some enormous fines from the EU on both faith on both Facebook and Google because the EU has teeth in their laws. And so there have been some billion dollar fines against Google and Facebook. And so, it's not in the US because there's nothing that regulates it. Now, California does. The California law authorizes the Attorney General of California to bring suits. There's no right of private action, which was a big element of the discussion of the California law and is a big element in the states that are proposing this. Companies do not want a right of private action. What that would mean is if there's a privacy violation, if someone believes their privacy has been violated by Facebook, who can sue? Well, in California now, it's only the Attorney General of California on behalf of the population. If there's a private right of action, it means 33,000 people can bring private actions. And obviously, the Facebooks and Googles of the world do not want that. They're pushing back heavily on rights of private action in these privacy legislation. So one more question for you, and then we'll, we'll end here. Someone wants to know, what can I do to protect my privacy? The first thing I would advise you to do is before you click OK, read the privacy statement and the terms of condition. Um, I know that I can't see any of you, but just go along with this for me. How many of you have ever clicked on a button when you're online downloading it as something, downloading an app on your phone, and it asks you to agree to the terms and conditions and the privacy statement? How many of you have clicked on that button without ever reading anything? Oh my gosh, I'll be transparent for everyone else who is on this call. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that all your hands are up. Okay, you need to pay some attention to this. I will give you an example of where, and obviously I teach this, I write in this area, so I am aware of these issues. At my doctor's office recently, I got an email saying that we are now using this interface app that we will send you your test results, you can ask questions, you can do this and that. And so when I went to download it on my phone, I clicked the little link that said privacy. And I was appalled to read that basically all of the protection you have under HIPAA is completely waived. It talked about my personal information, my sensitive personal information, my test results, that I am giving them permission to sell this and share this with whomever they want. My goodness. And all it takes is, and, and this goes back to basic contract law. When you click OK, what are you doing? You're agreeing. You're giving your consent. Right. You're agreeing to all the terms and conditions. So even though you get protection from HIPAA about that, if you go ahead and click OK, even if you've never read it, you're waiving all of those protections. So please read some of those privacy policies. I would imagine if you go back and look at some of the apps you're using, you know, medical ones, some of you probably use these new medical apps, mm -hmm. read their privacy policy. 
And if it were me, you know, go and cancel it and send them an email requesting that they delete your information. Wow. That's one of the things you can do. Wow. Um, you know, so anyway, okay, go. Any other? Uh, so that is, that's about it. Uh, but this has been incredibly fascinating and a phenomenal topic. Folks, thank you for joining us on this interesting and fascinating and a little bit scary. No, it should edition, be a lot scary. A, a lot scary edition of the Mercer University Professional Development Series with Professor Jody Blank. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to join us next week. Stay tuned. We've got another interesting topic as we talk about mental health and mental health wellness after COVID-19. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your engagement. Jody, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you're always informative and always intriguing. So thank you again. And folks, thank Welcome. you for watching.